Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone to the January 2022 Koha US General Meeting. Hope everyone is doing well and it's great to see everybody. Uh, let's see. Our agenda. Anybody needs to access it. There's the link in the chat. So we'll start off with announcements. Does anyone have any announcements? That looks like a big no. Well, I'm going to put in this announcement that everyone should be aware of the upcoming National Winnie the Pooh Day. And here's a link. I love Pooh, and his day is on January 18th. So go take a look. Especially since uh, now his works are in, or he is in the public domain, except for the Disney trademark character. But the original <laughs> drawings and text, public domain. All right. So, um, New business, uh, we're gonna do some board introductions. We've had, um, we have some new people on the board. So we wanna just um, have everybody go around and uh, just say something about yourself in your library. So I'll start. I am this year's Koha US president. Um, I work at Bedford Public Library in Texas. We are a single uh, site, one building library for a community that's just under 50,000. Uh, and we started with Koha in 2016. And we are really glad we made our switch from our previous vendor. So anybody can just jump in. I'm Christopher Brannon, uh, this year's vice president, and uh, this is my second go around. And uh, I'm with the Coeur d'Alene Public Library and the uh, Cooperative Information Network, better known as CIN. And uh, I work with George on the uh, terrific Every Other Thursday training videos and uh, uh, love working with, with Koha and work with all you fine people. And uh, I provided a link in honor of Winnie the Pooh Day, uh, the most absurd uh, book uh, I've heard of, Cooking with Pooh. <laughs> I see I joined at just the right time. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Marlat. I'm at the Corona Public Library. We're a single facility um, for, we've got about 164,000 uh, residents. Um, I'm new to the board and really excited. We've been with COHA since 2013 um, and are so happy with it <laughs> compared to the, the, the big name company we were with before. My name is Bob Benhoff. I uh, work, uh, I, I manage Ask a Cat, which is a consortia of mostly rural libraries here in Colorado. Um, we've been on community COHA since 2019, and we were LibLime for a bit before that, but we've been on COHA a, lot, a while and are big fans. Perhaps it's time um, for me Lauren. to introduce myself. Am I the only one left? No, no, Lauren still has to go. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, I'm the new member at large, unsupported. Um, <coughs> I'm getting over COVID. So sorry about the cough. Um, I am over a small um, special library in North Carolina, as well as um, some technical services and consulting for a consortium that is globally. 
that has academic, special, and small offices um, in those members. My name is John Sturbins. I'm the financial manager of the organization. I served as its first real treasurer. I timed out, as it were, and the position of financial manager was created to provide some stability to the organization's finances and operation. And I'm now in my second year serving in that role as financial manager. I'm now with the Detroit Area Library Network, exploring many open source solutions. Prior to this, and when I started joining, uh, attending Koha US meetings, I was actually with the University of Michigan's Kresge Business Administration Library, which was a, an unsupported system that I got operational and kept operational until I left, although I think they're going to shut that down. But sadly, that's neither my problem nor concern anymore. It's good to be back serving this community for another year. Okay, I think that's all of us. So that's our, our board for the year. Some of us have done a little bit before. Some of us are completely new. Um, so next is uh, 2022 membership. So I'm just going to say, and I think a lot of you already are probably members of Koha US. And if you aren't, you should be. And I think you should promote Koha US to other um, Koha libraries, other members at your own library. It's only $25 a year. That's very little. Uh, you get so much from being a member of Koha US. Um, I think that you should um, invite a friend to join Koha US, increase our membership. Uh, one of the board's goals is to increase membership because a lot of the uh, budget is based on the number of members we have. So there's my spiel on why you should be a Koha US member. And John, do you want to talk about uh, just joining and, and those kinds of things? Sure. If you were a member of Koha US in 2021, you will have received a renewal invitation in the mail uh, about the time of last month's general meeting. If, uh, and you can renew that, you can review rather that renewal invitation. And if everything is correct, renewing your membership is actually quick and easy. And despite the fact that it says there are a lot of screens, if you're a returning member and all of your information is correct, you bypass almost all of them. So that's a good thing. Um, if you were not a member in 2021, membership is open. You can join using the links found on our website and we'll take the usual information. Upon receipt of that information, you'll get a payment information screen and I will typically send out an invoice. Even if you've paid immediately, that invoice will reflect, reflect paid in full status. A lot of institutions were just requesting invoices, so I cut them off at the pass and just start generating them. And if you happen to be paid in full, that invoice will reflect that. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about membership. One of the responsibilities of the financial manager is the coordination of all of that. So if you do have any questions about your possible membership status or any questions about membership generally, feel free to contact me at treasurer at koha-us.org. And did you say how many members we currently have? That's part of the finance committee report, but I'll give away the goods by saying uh, as of the end of December, we had 16 members in good standing and uh, that number has since grown. We've had a number of people join since that point in time. Wonderful. So any other questions about membership? Um, I put a link in the chat uh, that you could go directly to join if you need that. What if we didn't get our renewal information? If you didn't get your renewal information, you're free to write me and I can confirm things for you. Or you can just uh, indicate that you were 
an existing member but didn't get your renewal invitation, you'll get prompted for your contact information again uh, if you select that option. I thought if they didn't get their renewal information, it meant that we didn't want them back. <laughs> <laughs> There are plenty of groups in which I would say that's true, but that's not true of this group. Everybody in this group has always been wonderful. To work. No, this is a good group. Yeah, I am trying to fill out the uh, application right now, and I can't get any of the links to work or the boxes, so I can't put in my name. Could somebody double check? It's working for me. Okay, it's probably my computer then. I wonder why. Reboot. Maybe later. <laughs> so uh, the next thing is our 2022 conference site location proposals. Um, the proposal form went out in December and the deadline for um, getting your proposal in was the 31st. Uh, we received one site location um, proposal, and that was from uh, George at Nichols um, to host in Lawrence, Kansas. And we, the board talked about um, one of the kind of perks of membership is to be able to vote on the location of the upcoming conference. And we only have one entry this time around. So we have talked about um, if there's only one proposal to sort of do an automatic option of um, an online only conference so that there would be, um, you know, a choice that members could make. So, um, I think that's where we are with that. And of course, we have the conference committee meeting directly following this meeting so we can talk more um, about how we want to really proceed um, with that. Um, does anybody else have any input on that? Okay. Uh, Owen's talking, but yeah, I think Owen's here. trying to say something, but ah. I can't hear him. It's like his microphone is really, really, really tiny. Going through a different microphone. If that happened to me once, no one could hear me because I was using the microphone on the uh, camera. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I figured you'd say that. How about now? There you go. Hey. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, <laughs> in, in the COHA general IRC meeting today, um, the, the COHA international conference was discussed and there have been zero bids for that. Um, so one of, the, one of the questions that folks had from there was, would Koha US be interested in um, taking that on? Um, and I think that what I imagine it could be is that whichever conference that Koha US decides to put on this year was de facto the Koha International Conference. Um, I'm not sure what difference that would make. Um, like you're you're going to be offering online programs anyway, um, which is a requirement of the of the international conference. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there. Um, you know, we could we could be going without a, a, a conference this year, um, or you know, you all could take it on. <laughs> the <laughs> other the other thing that was was talked about was doing. Um, some kind of joint operation with the French um, Koha group. And um, that was appealing to a lot of people, including me, because if you have 
um, conferences that are, are spanning time zones, that's even more conference time that um, people can have available to them. So I don't know if, the, if all that is too much and too late, um, but I wanted to, to float it um, and see what y'all thought. What time of the year do they usually have their conference? I'm trying to remember. It, it seems to vary like in Dublin, it was in the spring, I think. And it was that's, in Pakistan right before Christmas this year, last year. Um, that's one of the things I remember seeming to, weird to me about the, uh, we had the conference in Portland in September. And then six months later, seven months later, we had the, there was the conference in, uh, in uh, Dublin. So, and, and it seems to vary like that a lot. The one thing I would say is um, having an international conference in Lawrence, if, if we chose to have an in-person conference um, and having that be the international conference as well, my biggest concern there would be, you know, the, the location that we proposed for Lawrence Public Library um, is not, uh, it's suited well for Koha US. It might be suited well for Koha Khan, you know, the world Koha Khan, uh, if we still have pandemic and nobody comes. <laughs> but uh, Lawrence Public Library, the seating there is about 60 to 70 people um, with social distancing. Without social distancing, it's more like 100 and, 120 to 130 people. But you know, having people spaced out, which seems to be important right now, um, that would, if we did an in-person uh, and offered international people the opportunity to come. If there were a lot of people, we would probably have to consider a venue change. <clears throat> and other veil, other uh, other uh, locations are available in the Lawrence area, um, but uh, that's the location that we propose for right now is Lawrence Public Library, and it's not uh, it's certainly not as big of a room as we had in uh, in Portland. Uh, so that that would be an issue to consider. And I think it's something that the conference committee should talk about and and the conference committee meets right after this session. So now as far as an as far as an online only conference, that would be easy to do. And and I attended the uh, this year's uh, international conference as a speaker. Um, and I the online presence of the Pakistan conference was uh, was lacking so it was i think the only presentations i saw were the ones right before mine and right after mine that i was in the their uh, account to, to watch so if we if we did do you know we we could do a joint conference I, I agree that there's a there's an impact on uh how uh it affects uh the location but uh you know there there is the logistics too we operate a little bit different than uh than uh, uh the koha con uh in that uh we and, and, and i can't remember how we got around this with the portland one because that was a joint uh, conference as well, but uh, I know that we uh, do a, a conference fee and Doha Khan does not. So how we work around that, I, I, I can't remember how we did and I'm not sure how we do. Um, if it's separate, then the, the question is, do we need to separate the conferences far enough apart that, you know, we're going to, we're not going to uh, kill one conference in attendance. Uh, because there's another conference uh, too close to it. Uh, you know, if, if people have to choose between, you know, which one they, they commit time to or um, do a presentation at or whatever, uh, that's another consideration. To answer Christopher's question about what happened in, 20, um, in 2018, 18. it was Technically, we did not have a conference that year. Rather, we were a sponsor of the international event. 
serving as a sponsor for that event allowed us to collect contributions uh, in kind of what would have been considered registration payments. I think that you also have to consider that if you were officially the international conference that you would get sponsorships that you don't normally get for your US only one. Um, I mean, that's my hope. Um, and the, regarding the, the question of, of the timing, if there were, if there were two, are, are, were you saying maybe there's a COI US and then maybe there's an online um, COA con that's run by COA US? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think you would wanna try to run both, but I mean, that's, that's just the way I pictured it. We don't actually have the manpower to run both. Running a single conference is challenging enough. Um, having to attempt to do two of them is a completely separate ball game that I think is out of the, the scope of this organization. And that's uh, for the, the Portland event, Bywater Solutions was actually the one, the organization that did all the heavy lifting for Portland. They were the one that acquired the space. They paid the fees. They, they handled all of it. Our participation in that event was merely to uh, collect donations to support it. And I checked with Bywater to see if they were going to put in a bid, and they told me they were not. Are there some sort of uh, guidelines on the Kohakan? Uh, running that and uh, organizing that? I mean, most of the rules are, are in place for the bidding process. And since there's no bidding process, I mean, since, since it, the bidding process has completely, you know, failed, um, the, I, I think that the, that the agreed upon rules are that um, any conference has to be either online only or hybrid, um, which was certainly a problem with the recent Pakistan event because it wasn't online. That was disappointing. Um, and I don't, you know, a lot of so much, so many of these co op things are not like officially written down. Um, I, I don't know if there are rules that I, that I, I don't know are on a wiki somewhere or something, but I do think that um, that not charging for it is another one of the at least de facto rules. Just put the wiki in the chat for the processes for cohocons, which does include the format, which is like two to three days of conference, a break day, which can be at the beginning or the end and a hack fest of two to three days. So our two days of events and two days of like working sessions, if we go that way, would qualify. And then having like a, a event day. I can't imagine that, that anybody would object to altering that format if y'all were taking this on you know, in place of an official, you know, bid out Coacon. So I wouldn't uh, think that that was something that you would have to worry about. And it so does much. say the, the format's up to the organizers and that's just a, a recommendation. I think we come pretty close because initially we based our conference off of the Coacon format. Well, I think the next step here would be to have the conference committee talk about it and um, put together the voting because we traditionally vote, uh, the members of COHA US vote on which proposal, um, which since we only have, you know, two options this year, you know, we can, we can work on that. If we vote to have it in, in person in Lawrence and want to make that with an international component, that would be the one thing that I would say is that we would probably for the for the non-hack fest days, we would probably want to consider 
um, finding a, a, a bigger location. Um, that would be, like I said, my main concern for Lawrence. And there, there are a couple of good bigger locations. The other concern I would have for people, especially if people were trying to come from outside of the US, is that we are um, like almost an hour away from the nearest airport. There, well, there is an airport in Lawrence, but you're only gonna fly, you know, little Buddy Holly airplanes into there. So, uh, so that would be the other thing. You know, the the airport in Kansas City is an international airport, so, um, but it is a, a good forty five minute uh, to an hour drive, depending on the the season and the traffic. I agree. The committee should have that discussion in the. When, when does the committee meet again? Right after as, this meeting. Oh. Yeah, as soon as this meeting's over, so. Okay, so we'll we'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, bug discussion is the next thing on there, but I think we really need to move into committee reports. And the first one is the conference committee. And I think we've kind of covered that. <laughs> So um, development, um, I was doing the chairing development last year, but Christopher is doing that this year. Um, you wanna take it away, Christopher? Let me know if you need something from me. Uh, we have been on a, a short break because of uh, illnesses. Um, and Owen actually knows a little bit more than I do because he's been more hands-on because he's been involved with more of the, the coding questions and getting the, the, the developers uh, situated with our, our workflow uh, behind the scenes. Uh, my, my involvement in this year's development has been uh, uh, mostly about guidance about how things should uh work for this development uh, and uh, um, layouts, uh, you know, or uh, Owen is more the, the, the technical oriented person on in the group, but uh, we're planning to uh, get together soon and go through a demo. I think the dev team is just uh, getting some code in uh, updated. Is that right, Owen? Yeah, um, I asked them to post um, their code to GitLab so that we could test it ourselves, and um, they did. I sent some feedback about um, shortcomings, things that they had to fix, um, and they have not updated it. Um, I asked them yesterday if they would please do that so that we could, uh, so that we could have had a look at it before we scheduled the next meeting. So. Hopefully they can get that done. So is Auto Parallel still planning on meeting with just you and Christopher to go through code before the next development meeting, which we delayed the development meeting until the, I don't know, the second Friday, whatever the second Friday of this month is. It's fairly soon, isn't it? Yeah, is it the is it the end of this week? Uh, yeah, Friday. So obviously, we're not going to have time to have met with them before then. Um, okay. If they can get it together by Friday, we can just we can just do it live, as they say. That that would be nice. Um, yeah, if if they don't have that. Um, is there a reason that we need to meet until they have that that code and we've been able to to preview it? No. I don't think so because the last several meetings have been sort of here we are. Um, you know, what have you got for us, Auto Parallel? And it's there's been a delay, and I'm not really sure, you know, what we would have to talk about necessarily. So that's pretty much it for now. So you want to cancel that meeting on the calendar, Christopher? Or do you want me to do it? Um, do we want to give them one more poke and see if they could be ready by Friday? Yeah, I can uh, shoot out an email uh, 
in response and, and let them know that about that meeting and see if we can have anything by then. That'd be great. Thanks. Has there been any movement on the development we paid for, uh, for the account lines description that um, we co-sponsored with Southeast Kansas? We got, um, I asked Bywater and um, they, I'm trying to remember exactly what they said. They said that they had been discussing it and trying to look at the best approach or, you know, just the best way of proceeding and that it was scheduled for like, I don't want to say okay. this wrong, but it seemed like it was the next release or something. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like it was really starting to become something that was being dealt with. I've, I've got the ticket out. They, they're targeting uh, 20, 2205 for that development. We also had a brief discussion at the development meeting about um, perhaps in the future, we should, um, in, a, in the contract with whoever the developer is, we should specify a timeline for their actual work. We can't control what happens when it gets into the community and needs to be tested in QA because that anything could happen there. But maybe the thought of including, um, you know, some kind of, um, you know, when when work is expected to actually be done so that it can move forward. So that's probably something the committee will, you know, continue to talk about. Okay, we're up to education committee and I put down George as the chair because that's the last I heard was <laughs> be the thing. So I hope that's true. Uh, I'm the chair, but I haven't met yet uh, with the, the committee uh, as the chair. So, and I don't think I was at the last meeting. So I have no idea what was discussed at the last meeting. So um, that's all we have to say about the education committee. Well, sort of, um, I would say that Christopher and I are back on schedule recording new videos. Um, but I'm not sure that anything else beyond that, uh, happened in January or this is January it happened in December. So oh, I, I can chime in cause I was de facto power hungry leader in December. <laughs> um, we mostly just talked about the website. We, we, talked about restructuring a little bit, reorganizing and getting the content um, from like conferences organized, which is just kind of an ongoing project. Um, but we came up with some good ideas to kind of make things flow a little better and make it easier to find things. Uh, so that's on the agenda to do. Wow, I guess I was there for that because I remember all those discussions. I just. Uh... <laughs> Next month, I'll be on top of it. Okay, so uh, finance committee, John. Thank you for including the link to the finance committee report, Jennifer. In terms of final membership numbers for 2021, we were at 65. This is a decrease from the final membership count for 2020. And as of the end of last month, we had 16 members in good standing. That is to say, they re-registered for the organization and had paid their membership dues. And as you might expect, given the fact that it's early on in the year, that number has actually grown. I think it's about 21 or 22 now. And I have the fun of wandering out in the cold to go to the bank to make some deposits to uh, finalize some of those things. Financially, of course, the organization continues to remain viable. If you look at the preliminary numbers for December, you'll see the closing balance within our primary and only bank account is just over $11,000. This is very close to the reconciled membership year balance, which we'll highlight in the next finance committee report, which will also talk about the status of the organization generally. Earlier last week, uh, actually, I think it was Friday, I finished the work, uh, the board received preliminary numbers about the reconciled balances, and those will be shared on a broader scale shortly. 
Our PayPal balance to the end of the month was $354.75. Not surprisingly, um, nearly all of those funds were related to paid memberships for 2022. A few other matters, we've already talked about membership for the upcoming year. In this new year, and now that we are in a new budget cycle, the, uh, the, by that I say I will begin pursuit of the ALA annual exhibition space. You'll recall that we had actually signed up for space in Chicago in 2020, forwarded that to Chicago in 2021, were refunded, and that refund earmarked specifically for this purpose in 2022. Well, they still haven't canceled it, Registration actually hasn't even opened generally, but it is possible now to acquire exhibition space. We will be pursuing a small press table, uh, which does have a number of restraints against it, none of which will really impact our ability, which is to provide information about the organization and show off our demonstration instance that is being worked on in earnest. According to currently available pricing, the cost for this table will be $1,100, which is slightly less than what we had paid for the two Chicago conferences, which was $1,200. The ALA Exhibition Hall will be open from June 24th to 27th as part of the larger ALA conference, which is being held June 23rd through 28th. The last thing, it's a new year and the Finance Committee is always looking for new members. If you have any interest in serving in the Finance Committee, please feel free to contact me at treasurer at koha-us.org. That's it for this month's Finance Committee report. I'm glad to entertain any questions that anybody might have. All right, thank you. Oh, sorry, I had to get up to the uh, mute button. Uh, the ALA conference is in DC, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. I could probably... Uh, and a table for a couple of days. Yeah, we'll talk. Uh, we'll, we've never actually gotten to the point of staffing the table. <laughs> it's always been canceled before that. Uh, but uh, getting the space is the easy part. We have to, we'll have to buy liability insurance, which is actually a, a clause in the contract we signed. And once we get out to probably April, uh, we'll talk about staffing and all those other good things. And you're right, staff rather than man, my apologies. Thank you, John, wonderful as always. Uh, next is fundraising and we don't really have a committee chair or a committee. So if you are interested in chairing the fundraising committee or electing one of your friends to chair the fundraising committee, uh that would be great two questions yes um can i elect my enemies instead <laughs> <laughs> uh last month we talked about um rebranding this committee did the board discuss that at all we discussed it briefly i'm not sure that we came to any real conclusions does anybody remember no, it was mentioned, um, but we didn't get into a deep discussion on it. Okay, so that wraps up committee reports. So we're down to uh, open discussion, Bug, bugs, issues, anything you want to chime in with. I will mention one thing, and if somebody else has something uh, to talk about prior to that, because I have to dig it up, um, go for it. But uh, uh, there was one thing that I talked about to you, Barbara, uh, for that. Well, I could talk for a moment about something I learned last week at the cataloging SIG, but I already told you about it, and you gave me the answer. Um, but yes, you can store external documents on the COA server. 
uh, the default setup. Uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, come on brain, you don't have to make any changes. There's an actual folder and there's something in the uh, template that goes right there or configuration file rather. Um, it just gives you uh, an enormously long, uh, something like 32 character uh, file name, just link to that. And then on the news uh, configuration page, which is where the center and right columns are now, uh, you can put in plain HTML text. You just have to click the correct button. So it's easier than you think, and Vimal Kumar's directions are spot on. I'll add to that and say that as I was leaving Kresge back in 2020, we had just started actually uploading invoices, scanned copies of our invoices and storing them on our actual Koha server. And there is a table actually, that's what led me to this path. Um, there's a whole table in the schema that talks about that. But the interesting thing to note in that specific situation is that you can't search for the files or the file names directly because the entirety of the file and all of its properties gets thrown into this monstrously long hexadecimal number that is stored in the table. So you need to have some semblance of, of order to be able to get to that information and call it back up. Yeah, I just created a record and put the long link in the 856. And if you want an image that also goes in the 856, but you can put it somewhere else eventually, because that way you won't have to click here to go to the document links in the catalog or the OPAC page. Um. The bug that I had uh, wanted to talk about uh, is in the, the chat. Um, it is uh, 26058. Um, it is one that is on my radar next for our consortium to, to contribute to. Uh, and Barbara was the one that uh, actually uh, posted the bug. Um, and this is where the preference allow holds on patron possessions um, allows you to place a hold on something that you currently have uh, checked out. Um, normally, we don't like this, but we've been forced to, to turn it on because uh, it affects uh, things like uh, serials. Um, you know, we've got magazines, somebody will have, you know, it's all in one record, somebody will have one uh checked out and they want to place a hold on the next one and they can't so this setting fixes that but the problem is it's an all or nothing um i'd like to see this uh become more granular so that you don't have to make this happen for all of your items but maybe specific uh collections or items uh certain records uh so if anybody has any interest in it, um, I'm going to say, first of all, please uh, make some comments on there, contribute to the bug. Um, I am reaching out to uh, people to see if there are others that want to contribute to this. Um, if we get through this development that we're currently on uh, for Koha US, uh, I might throw it in uh, for the next suggestion, uh, next development to, to contribute towards. This is a, this is a good one, I think, uh, that affects many people uh, more uh, so than they know, but uh, um, I think it's a good one to, to work towards. I know that um, 
I know that I have had a conversation on a bug report about this same issue before. So I'm gonna go digging to see if there's any more info about the historical background for this. But I, I agree hundred percent. I, I, I remember specifically commenting on a bug. Can we please have an exception for serials for this um, hold policy? And obviously it never went anywhere, but I'm gonna take a look because I'm, I, th I think we're interested in, in that development too. Okay. I think it would be awesome to have a system preference like what we have for OPAC hidden items where you can, you know, specify, you know, the th these things, you know, uh, if collection code equals and then a series of, you know, uh, values and, or if you, that you, that would be flexible enough to, to use with locations, collection codes, item types, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, uh, that that would make it really flexible for anybody because there are too many times in the past where it's been you know uh, this is the kind of thing that I could easily somebody see somebody saying let's put that in the circulation rules and then creating a whole nother set of things to deal with in the circulation rules uh, that wouldn't be as flexible probably so I think it would be a great idea anybody that's interested in this to contribute their thoughts on how they would see this ideally working because, you know, I might have an idea of how this could be implemented, but it might not be the most straightforward or, or uh, best way for it to, to function. And um, there have been a few times when, you know, I, I lay out how I think it works and then somebody else chimes in and throws out a, an idea of how it should function or you know, be controlled and it works out a little bit better and works for more people. So, uh, the more the more people that can chime in about you know their thoughts on this, um, it's a good start uh, in a in a bug process so that we can get get on the same page and mesh out something that that works for everybody and not just the person that that comes up with the idea. So, uh, please chime in on it especially since these things work differently for a single site library, which is where my mindset comes from. And then I hear George or Christopher or Lizette talk about their consortiums and they have completely different needs. Um, moving on, I do have a question for the group. I was wondering, has anybody implemented anything like um, uh, shelving location maps within Koha for their collections? I toyed around with, this is a long time ago, uh, our previous vendor had that kind of thing. So you could click on a location and you could see a map of the library. It didn't take you directly, you know, to that location, which was, uh, you know, that would be a fancier thing. But I toyed around doing something with like adding a link um, to the detail record in the OPAC, it's whatever that little side menu is on the right hand side where you can, you know, place your hold, print, whatever that's called. And, you know, adding a link there that would just be to the map, but I never really did that. Um, there is a bug that's been out for a while, and I think. There was another one and I marked this duplicate something a little bit more recent, but there was more uh, discussion in the original uh, bug. And the bug, you can tell, is pretty old. It's bug number 737. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen a three digit bug number. Um, but uh, um, I've been throwing, shooting some ideas around and, and I, I posted an idea and then I, I modified that idea and just throwing around some ideas. Um, and so far, you know, I have, I have a, a decent concept of how to implement something like this with a little bit of uh, a jQuery. 
I mean, it would be nice to see something a little bit more built in, uh, but there are some ways to implement something. I, I, I've, uh, I'm toying with this idea and, and I'm going to be playing with it on our, our uh, test server a little bit, but, uh, um, but currently my idea centers around uh, having a, uh, a specific shelving location for, uh, for each library. So instead of having a, 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 ge a generic shelving location uh, that all libraries use, I would break it down to having uh, shelving locations that are assigned to each specific library. And I'll, I'll test with you know, just one branch for, for the time being, but um, that way we could isolate both the library you know, that the map would be for and the location in the library. And then I have to incorporate some court sort of URL that would be linked to that, uh, where the, the map for that specific area and that library would reside and uh, then uh, use some jQuery to find that combination of library and uh, uh, shelving location and provide a link or icon or something next to that shelving location so that somebody can click on it and see where that is exactly. So th that's, you know, some ideas that I'm, I'm tossing around there, but uh, um, uh, that's another bug that I would like to uh, see uh, people participate in and throw around some ideas and, you know, what I've thrown out there and what they think of that. And maybe that will, um, inspire a developer or somebody to um, down the road to uh, incorporate something that's a little bit more hardwired into it and, and a little bit more robust than having individual shelving locations for each library. So. Okay, my uh, cheap and dirty way of doing that, probably be putting a series of links down the left navigation page, click here, bring up a map. Um, does, can you have a different navigation page for each branch? It would require some jQuery, you know, looking at what branch is logged in. And, um, that's only if you're logged in, uh, well, I, you, 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 you could have all of the, the, the links up there. It would just mean that they'd have to sift through. Um, for their specific branch. And but at the top right where you choose my library, is that dependent on being logged in? We only have remember, one. Remember, so. we're, we're talking OPAC side too. Yes, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. So let's say go back to OPAC for library A. Could you have a different set of navigation links than library J? Or I think you could have right link news links different from each library for each library. I think the, the, the big challenge is, you know, whether or not somebody is logged in, um, you know, how you're going to present those links. Um, so, you know, um, my my model, my my thought school of thought is, you know, I don't, I you know, you could have just you know a generic floor plan of of the library showing the different areas, uh, different collections, um, if you want just a single map. But for me, um, our library is big enough that I would I break it down to different. Uh, section Z, uh, so that uh, people have a reference point and know where that specific collection is rather than having to look through the map and try and find that that specific collection, especially if it's a small enough collection. Um, they wouldn't want to have to sift through all of the entire map trying to find that that specific collection. So right. um, there would be a lot of maps involved in in my particular model. So I've, I know I've seen this in implementation before. I was trying to find it. I did find this um, link I just put in chat is a co-op instance. And if you scroll down, it's using like a third party service to generate the map. 
Um, I, I don't know if you could replicate that easily, but it's an interesting idea because uh, their maps actually direct you like from the front door to right where it is on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And they link to the act individual item. So if there's a map associated, it's showing up in the status field. I think essentially, you know, the the, the concept is the same there. Um, somehow, you know, they're figuring out what location, shelving location, and or library, if it's multiple branches, uh, is displayed there, and then providing that link to the map somewhere. And so, providing you know, having maps available is not a big you know, not a big ordeal. I mean, I can upload maps into to Koha directly. Um, I did see one of, one of the, the thoughts I had was I did see that uh, locations, you know, you could assign icons. It's too bad that the, I, you know, it would be nice if icons could be customizable and you could, you uh, could, or something similar to the icons, if they had something uh, that they, that you could upload an image and you could have you could assign it to that particular shelving location. Ultimately, that would be a, a great built-in with with Koha. You know, you're creating your shelving locations and you're assigning uh, an, an image to that. And if an image is assigned to it, then a link shows up next to that shelving location wherever it's displayed in Koha, particularly in the uh, the uh, bib details and the items. I'm looking for it, but there is a bug out there to allow um, remote images for authorized values. Um, and I'm looking for it. I'm just not finding it where I expected it. Um, but there is in the authorized values table, there is a place to store a remote image, a link to a remote image. And I have a workaround um, that maybe we should do a video about on how to force a remote image uh, location into that. Uh, spot where the icon usually goes. Um, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try and find the bug for adding remote images to authorized values and post it in the chat box. Okay, I just checked on uh, the Cheerful Valley Public Library site, uh, my test site. Uh, you can have different news blocks for different libraries. So you could just put a link in there, click here for the map, and then have the map stored, stored, uh, stored on the site. Of course, it's not elegant, but it works, which is what I do with Koa. George, you do something much more elegant. George Owen posted the link to a bug that might be referring what to, to what you were talking about. Yeah, that's the one I just found too. I, I was spelling authorized values the uh, way it is in the database, not uh, not with the Z. That always gets me. I either I no matter what how hard I try, I always spell it wrong because half the time I'm looking for it with an S, somebody spelled it with a Z, and half the time I'm looking for a Z, for with the Z, somebody spelled it with the S. I prefer the the spelling with the silent Q. Like Charles Dickens, right? <laughs> I was thinking uh, Henry with H E N three R Y with the three being silent. So we're right up at the hour. Any last minute contributions? Okay, so uh, the conference committee will meet right after this. Everyone else is free to go. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good Bye, meeting. everybody. Another interesting meeting. And I guess we can stop the recording.
Do we record the conference meeting so we can stop the recording?